it's important to remember that not all precipitation reactions are suitable for gravimetric analysis. The watchwords for designing an effective gravimetric analysis is that to get a quantitative yield of a pure precipitate, you must choose an analyte and precipitant pair that leads to a precipitate which is highly insoluble and easy to collect by filtration so you can actually recover better than 99.99% of the precipitate that is made in your chemical reaction. The precipitate should be stable under heating so there's no chance of a mixed chemical formula or mixed speciation in the product and the precipitate must form large crystals that can easily be collected by uh, by vacuum filtration. Again, if any crystals slip through the filter when you're collecting the precipitate, you won't achieve a, qu a quantitative yield of the precipitate, and you won't know the exact mass of the amount of precipitate that you synthesized in the chemical reaction. It's also important to note that a potential interference must be identified and dealt with prior to analysis. There are a couple of potential ways for removing interference prior to beginning a gravimetric analysis, including precipitating them out or filtering them out. You can use a masking agent to complex them and keep them soluble in a side chemical reaction. There are several strategies available, but you need to be aware of the possibility of interference and decide how you're going to separate them from the precipitation reaction that you're going to run in a gravimetric analysis. Generally, all gravimetric analyses have the same basic steps. The majority of the reaction is going to be occupied with a slow precipitation reaction at a pH. The majority of the procedure will involve a slow precipitation reaction with the reaction mixture buffered at a specific pH, which will encourage the precipitate solid crystals to grow slowly and to grow into relatively large crystals so that they're easy to collect. Following the growth of the precipitation and the termination of the precipitation reaction, you need to isolate and oven dry the pure precipitate to make sure that you collect all the precipitate that's available and you need to oven dry it to make sure that no water and no solvent remains on the crystals to throw off their mass. Lastly, you need to determine the exact mass of the isolated precipitate, which often involves an analytical lab technique called weighing to constant mass, which you'll cover when you do your gravimetric analysis in lab. But these are very general steps. And so the question is, from a chemistry standpoint, how do we actually achieve these things so that we can run an effective gravimetric analysis? Well, we're going to look at a specific example which will be similar to the experiment that you are going to run in lab in a couple of weeks. We're going to look at a gravimetric analysis that is designed to analyze for calcium ion using oxalate as a counter ion which will yield a water insoluble precipitate. So the general chemical reaction looks like this. Our analyte would be calcium which is going to be present in an aqueous solution so our matrix is water we are going to combine a calcium-containing unknown solution with sodium oxalate or oxalic acid. Two sources of the counter ion oxalate, which has the chemical formula C2O42-. We're going to buffer this reaction mixture with urea, which decomposes with heating, and we're going to boil the whole mixture so that the urea slowly decomposes and slowly so that the urea slowly decomposes, neutralizing any oxalic acid that's around, and slowly but surely increasing the pH of the solution and making it more likely that all the calcium will precipitate out. If we run the reaction slowly and carefully, we will initially isolate a white insoluble solid that would fall to the bottom of our beaker, and that would be the hydrated crystal calcium oxalate monohydrate. So again, a monohydrate means that there's a single water molecule adsorbed to the crystal for every molecule of the calcium oxalate precipitate itself. We would then collect this by vacuum filtration, allowing all the soluble impurities to wash through the filter and the pure, well-formed precipitate to be left behind. The precipitate would then be oven dried at 105 degrees Celsius, 
to drive off any water that's not strongly adsorbed inside the crystal. And this would ensure that our precipitate is collected entirely in this form, calcium oxalate monohydrate. And this is the basic procedure that you will follow for your lab analysis of calcium in a couple weeks. It's actually extremely important that the precipitate that's formed is stable and has a known chemical formula. Because if the precipitate isn't pure, stable, and possessing a known chemical formula, there's no accurate way to use stoichiometry to determine the relationship between the number of moles of the precipitate you collected and the moles of the analyte that you started with. So knowing the chemical speciation and the chemical formula of the precipitate is crucial to a successful gravimetric analysis. If you're working with calcium oxalate as your precipitation reaction, there are a couple of different forms of precipitate that you can isolate, which will be stable for analysis, depending on what temperature you choose to dry your final product at. So if you dry your calcium oxalate monohydrate precipitate at a relatively low temperature, like 105 degrees Celsius, this is the chemical form of your precipitate, and it has a specific molar mass. Now, the temperature and the time you use to dry your precipitate in the oven is actually extremely crucial to the nature of the product that you get in this oxalate-based gravimetric analysis. If you dry your calcium oxalate monohydrate for 105, at 105 degrees Celsius for a couple of hours, you will isolate the calcium oxalate monohydrate crystals as your final precipitate. But if you dry your product at a higher temperature or dry it for longer, you can actually isolate different chemical species of calcium and a counter ion because the oxalate will undergo a decomposition process. So in this gravimetric analysis, like many other gravimetric analyses, the temperature and the time at which you, for which you dry the precipitate is actually really crucial to determining the chemical nature of your product. And so drying time and drying temperature are really important experimental parameters in your gravimetric analysis. If you dry your calcium oxalate monohydrate precipitate at a slightly higher temperature, say 120 degrees Celsius, you'll actually drive that single water of hydration off the crystal, leaving behind an anhydrous calcium oxalate solid. There's a typo in the notes that I originally handed out with this lecture, so please go back in and make that correction indicate that you'll get anhydrous calcium oxalate and the water driven off here. If you dry your calcium oxalate at an even higher temperature, say around 400 degrees Celsius, this calcium oxalate anhydrous species will decompose even further, forming calcium carbonate, limestone, and releasing CO2. And if you dry it still hotter for longer, at 600 degrees Celsius for say about five hours, the calcium carbonate will actually decompose to form calcium oxide and release another molecule of CO2 gas. So depending on your drying conditions, you can run a gravimetric analysis for calcium using oxalate as your counter ion and dry your product at any of these temperatures, but you need to know the connection between the temperature and the time you dry your precipitate for and what the nature of the final product is going to be for you to use the stoichiometry accurately. If you misidentify which calcium oxalate precipitate you have based on your drying conditions, you'll use the wrong molar mass when calculating the link between the mass of your precipitate and the number of moles of your analyte you started with. So in lab, it will be particularly important for you to know your drying times and to assign the correct chemical formula to your precipitate to get an accurate result. It's also important to point out that there's not really a one-size-fits-all precipitant to precipitate a variety of metal ions from solution. And that's kind of important because gravimetric analysis needs to be specific, and you want the precipitant that you choose to just precipitate one likely metal that's in the sample matrix. Otherwise, you have the potential to get interferences, you have the potential to get interference complexing with the counter ion and precipitating out separately, and then you won't have a pure precipitate. So in general, you carefully choose a precipitant that's only likely to 
precipitate out the analyte that you're looking for in your reaction mixture. And every metal has a slightly different ideal precipitant. I should say every metal cation has a slightly different ideal precipitant to trigger its gravimetric precipitation. For calcium, oxalate is the most common choice. For lead, chromate or sulfate are commonly chosen as the precipitant. But you can go to tables, and there are tables included in Chapter 27 in Harris, where you can see that depending on which metal you're interested in, there's a recommended precipitant to choose to make sure that you precipitate exclusively the metal you're looking for with minimal interference. And these tables also tell you the chemical formula of the product that you're going to form based on your drying conditions and your procedure. There are also a number of organic molecules that act as effective precipitants in these types of gravimetric analyses. We will not go into these in great detail. Um, in the nickel precipitation video that I included at the front of this lecture, dimethylglyoxime, which is this nitrogen oxygen containing species right here, is actually a precipitant that's extremely specific for nickel, and it forms a nice red color, so it can actually be used to spray on surfaces where you believe you can find nickel, and the formation of a red color when you apply the DMG spray actually indicates the presence of nickel. So dimethylglyoxime is a particularly useful precipitant if you're looking for, uh, to analyze nickel gravimetrically. In terms of how to get large crystals with good purity, it's important to understand a couple of basics of crystal growth. Now, crystal growth is an extremely complicated and fascinating process in many respects, but you can recognize, if you can recognize a couple of fundamental features of how crystals or solid inorganic chemical compounds grow as they begin to precipitate out of solution, you'll be able to understand better how the steps of your gravimetric analysis procedure fit together. So the first thing to recognize is that crystals and precipitate are technically slightly different inorganic solids, whereas crystals tend to be extremely high purity and grown extremely slowly. Most precipitates tend to be relatively impure chemical compounds, unless their growth is carefully controlled, like in a gravimetric analysis, that form a little bit quicker. As a result, when you're running a gravimetric analysis, you want to slow down the precipitation process to the point where you're not really getting a rapid precipitation like you might have seen in some of your qualitative investigations in GenChem, but you're getting a relatively slow precipitation, a relatively slow precipitation reaction, which is starting to border on crystal growth. Whether you're growing a crystal or a precipitate, which really just differ not in terms of the chemical composition, but differ in how well the, in how ordered the ions that make up the solid are arranged. The more ordered the ions in the solid, the more crystalline it's going to appear. Both processes start with the same basic steps. In crystal growth, we consider that the solid forms in solution through a process called nucleation, where several atoms or several ions that constitute the chemical compound grow together in a very tiny cluster, probably less than a nanometer across. As the crystal growth continues, you start to get a supersaturated solution of all these nuclei, these developing crystals or these seeds for future crystals, and the crystals begin to lose their solubility and fall out of solution. During this process, you have additional ions adding to the developing crystals and causing each of these nuclei to slowly grow into a larger and larger crystal. The idea in gravimetric analysis is we want to slow down these crystal growth steps to grow ordered arrays of, ni of relatively nice crystalline materials with extremely large crystallites, which will be easily snagged by a filter. So the more slowly the precipitation reaction occurs, the more crystalline the solid is going to be, which leads to greater purity and leads to larger crystallites, which are more easily captured and isolated by the future, which are more easily captured and isolated using the aspirator 
and the vacuum filtration. So the idea is the more slowly your solid grows, the larger your crystallites are going to be and the more pure they are. Slower crystal growth particularly tends to lead to higher order of crystallinity in the solid because the crystal will to some extent self-select for ions that fit naturally into the pockets of the growing crystal. So if you grow your crystal slowly, for instance, if you're growing a silver chloride precipitate and you're trying to make it as crystalline as possible, the silver and the chloride ions fit together in a specific unit cell in a specific crystalline structure, much the way you saw back when you talked about the crystal structure of metals and salts in general chemistry. The more slowly this process happens, the more the structured order of the crystal can act to exclude ions or impurities that don't fit into the crystal lattice, and slow crystal growth tends to favor the incorporation of uniform chemical composition into the developing crystals. Therefore, it excludes impurities and you get a higher purity crystal the more slowly your crystal grows. So crystal growth is something that you might be able to tell I really want to get into and talk about in a lot of technical detail, but that's not necessarily appropriate for this level of quantitative analysis. I'm mostly bringing it up to give you a little insight into the process that's actually occurring during the gravimetric analysis. But the important things to remember that when you're designing your gravimetric analysis is you need slow growth conditions, you need a precipitate that will a precipitant that will be as specific as possible for your analyte, and you're looking for large crystallites with high purity, which makes them easy to collect. At the end of the day, the key to a successful gravimetric analysis is you need to know the chemical composition of your product, it needs to be pure, and you need to recover the precipitate that you've prepared in as close to 100% yield as you possibly can. The last thing we're going to talk about today is we're going to do an example where we show you how to use the principles of gravimetric analysis to analyze the metal content of a mixture, and I'll see you back here for that example when you're ready.